in the real needs of our customers and we have a heritage in our company of listening and learning from customer feedback. And you're gonna see that wound throughout the entire uh, event here. But for the last 27 years, uh, we, we believe we've been a company with, with big ears and paying close attention to the needs and wants of our customers. You'll get a sense for how we're doing that with social media and how it's affecting the kinds of products and services and capabilities that we have today as a company. Dell is a very different business than it was five or 10 years ago. And as we have seen our customers use IT differently, our business has evolved as well. And you're gonna learn a lot more about the kinds of services and capabilities that we have now. And the focus that we have on helping our customers really uh, go beyond the product and really create a, a huge impact inside their business. Uh, we started out certainly as a product company. And as those products became more and more powerful, customers wanted us to know more about their business and wanted us to be able to provide a complete solution in the vertical industry that they operate in. And so you see a big focus on services and on end-to-end -end solutions. And so you're gonna hear about the new Dell, which is an end-to-end -end solutions provider, and yes, we still care about the client device. So there's been a lot of change, a lot of progress at Dell, and this event is really about explaining that to our customers. One of the things that you probably also noticed is that in the last 18 months, Dell has been one of the most active acquirers in the technology industry. And what we seek to do are find those solutions that are really innovative and disruptive and provide fantastic value to customers and help them solve the biggest pain points that they have. These are companies that are generally already growing very quickly on their own, but with the Dell brand and the Dell distribution and increased investment in R&D, we can accelerate the growth. And we have fantastic examples of this like Equalogic and Compellent and Force 10, Case, Boomi, SecureWorks, and you're gonna learn a lot about these. Case, as an example, is a software company. It really helps customers manage the endpoint devices. Boomi is a company that innovates in something called the integration cloud. This is right at the leading edge of how customers are really challenged in cloud adoption. How do you connect your legacy apps and your cloud apps together? Boomi does that. And SecureWorks helps customers address the enormous security challenges that exist. Now you put all this together and the capabilities that we have, the progress that we're driving as a company is showing up in our financial results. In our last 12 months, our earnings per share grew by 83% year over year. We've had very strong cash flow, and we now have over $16 billion in cash investments, which gives us plenty of capability to continue to grow and invest in, in our business. That investment is certainly uh, in the form of these acquisitions, but it's also organic investment inside the business. And you've heard about some of the investments that we're making around cloud services and solution centers and the expanded group of Dell team members around the world that can help our customers apply these solutions very effectively. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Steve Schuckenbrock to tell you a little bit about some of these cloud investments and some of the cap new capabilities we'll bring to the customers. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, first, also like to add my welcome. It was uh, terrific to see that our first event ever here, uh, this Dell World sold out, and that the first people to sign up are the people that are here in this room. And so, thanks for thanks for your participation. If I look at the services arena, I'm pretty excited about the progress we've made this year and the offerings we're bringing to customers. Michael talked about big ears and listening to customers, and what we're hearing from customers is a combination of things that is kind of new, I think, in this space, where the last several years have been really defined through efficiency and virtualization and consolidation and driving a lot of cost out. Now we're hearing a tremendous amount about speed to innovation and the ability to bring value to businesses on a much more rapid basis. And I think 
the cloud and mobility and this sort of always on, always available kind of expectation that's been built out of the consumer world, frankly, is bringing itself to bear quite directly in the commercial space. And so we have this event with mobility and with cloud and with massive um, levels of, uh, uh, of efficiency being enabled through technology converging simultaneously in our customers' environments. And as a result, they're reaching to Dell for our traditional capabilities to serve those needs and reaching to Dell for new capabilities and pushing us, frankly, to drive new value. Some of the things that we are quite proud to continue and to see. We're number one in services in the healthcare space. We're number two in the education space around the globe. For 35 of the last 45 quarters, we've been the number one support company as ranked by some of the leading analysts that report on that space. When you look at the where some of our newer offerings have been uh, ranked by the analysts, you know, we were really happy to see our service desk capabilities and our distributed compute capabilities ranked in the magic quadrant for the first time. And you've, we've got a lot more offerings that are headed, headed in that same direction. So we feel good about the momentum, but more importantly, we're listening to the customers to understand the kinds of capability that we can bring to bear locally in their markets that will help them solve this massive convergence of speed, innovation, and efficiency. So we announced earlier this year we're making a billion dollars of investments in new data centers and solution centers and building out capabilities to serve our customers. We're happy that we've now opened nine of those solution centers. We've hosted um, uh, six, seven hundred customers in those centers and helped each of those customers in the design of a specific solution to their pain points from storage to networking to data center automation and to the implementation of private clouds. We've also uh, just yesterday announced the opening of our new data center facility that will host cloud architectures and VDAS and capability in the image management space, particularly to serve the healthcare industry in Slough in the UK. Today we announced the opening of our new data center in Quincy, Washington. And at that opening, it is now one of the greenest and most efficient data centers in the world relative to the power and cooling efficiency that serves our customers exceptionally well, and will serve our customers exceptionally well. And we've already started booking orders against that data center with some large outsourcing contracts that are implementing private cloud architectures as well as with some of the new capabilities around VDAS and the new vCloud offering that we just announced a few about a month ago at, uh, with, with Paul Moritz at VMware. So we're pretty excited about the momentum that uh, we're seeing. We're pretty excited about the investments that we're making. And much, much more than that, we're excited about what the customers are telling us. They're telling us that they want our help in helping them migrate their applications to take advantage of the new architectures. They're telling us they want our help in enabling mobility in their environments and making sure that they can target new types of applications to serve their business strategies more effectively. We think Dell's the company to do that. We're excited to share all of that with you over the next couple of days and look forward to uh, all of the questions and all of the ideas that come from the audience we've gathered here in Austin. So with that, I'll flip it over to Brad. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, when we got together last, probably uh, many of you in May, we, we laid out a, a very different kind of enterprise strategy than what I think our, our competitors are. And we basically set a tone where we're going to drive the most efficient and flexible infrastructure for the virtual era. And that strategy remains the same. We haven't changed it. And we've been uh, very busy here over the last uh, several months here just continue to execute against that strategy. Uh, we, uh, Michael has alluded to, we have executed against it organically, but with the same thing organically. And so when we look at what we've done here, uh, our focus is to continue to drive that differentiated strategy very aggressively uh, uh, and, and, and bring those solutions to market. So we have probably, uh, you know, already this year, we have added over uh, 700 engineers organically. Nothing to do with the inorganic acquisition. These are people that you might not have uh, uh, you know, thought about, though. I mean, these are software experts. These are people driving more solution capabilities. 
And so we're driving this, and then you're seeing us participate much more regularly in much higher value workloads uh, across the entire enterprise. Secondly, we've been extremely aggressive at driving the acquisitions. And in, in the integration of the acquisition, that's where all the value is created. So since uh, uh, you know, we, we closed Compel on uh, February 22nd, since then we've added over 300 people. Again, principally engineers, principally technical specialists we put in the field so that we get closer to the customers, understand the requirements, and drive exactly the kind of solutions that those customers need. Uh, uh, since we met, we've also bought Force 10. And so we're driving the same kind of integration at, on the networking side. And Force 10 brings some of the most exciting, top of the rack, 10 gigabit technology, distributed core technology. And we think it provides a, a, that missing piece when we look across our, 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 our server capabilities, our storage capabilities, and now our networking capabilities, begin to drive the most efficient, flexible uh, infrastructure for converged solutions, for cloud solutions, for physical, for virtual, for premise, off premise. And unlike the other folks, you know, we don't think it has to be these uh, kind of these, uh, you know, form factor specific type solutions. So we're driving the same kind of tools that work in a bladed environment, in a rack environment, in a tower environment, in a multi-hypervisor environment. It works with the existing investments our customers have already made. Uh, almost 99% of our customers, if not quite 100, are our heterogeneous environments. They've made a number of different choices at a number of different layers of their infrastructure stack. And so we're driving solutions that work with them that doesn't require them to rip and replace. And so you're gonna to continue to see us drive exactly in this direction. We are absolutely committed to open, capable, and affordable. And, and, and you're, you're gonna see us uh, bringing things higher and higher up in the stack, solving their much more mission critical problems. And it's just execution, execution. We're absolutely committed to this strategy. And even with time, it feels even more differentiated than what everyone else is doing. And as we interface with customers, giving them the bridge to the past, to the decisions they've already made, to the investments they already made, but a path to the future without creating new silos because you're bringing in kind of standalone, incompatible with what they've already purchased, is resonating very loudly. And so we're on that path and we're razor focused on executing and you should expect that you know, the moves that we've made, you're going to continue to see us take the ones we've made forward and, 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 and look for the other gaps that we think are absolutely essential for fulfilling that mission. And with that, let me share it with Dave. Yeah, so I think we're going to open it up now for questions and uh, keep this very interactive. And so, uh, Karen, I'm going to actually ask Karen to help uh, guide the uh, process here. Uh, so why don't we uh, open it up for, for questions? So who, who's got the first question? Bring back on okay. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Uh, first, Google started using common parts to make servers to build in, in, to, into huge data centers. Now Amazon is promising you know, the cheapest economy of scale. With Dell's legendary chain supply management, you know, how can you make better data centers? Brad, why don't you address this? You have a lot of uh, knowledge and experience here. I, and I like the way you asked the question, how do you make better data centers? Because what we're finding the customers that, uh, that uh, you know, when, when the problem's a data center and it's not a node, uh, there's all kinds of things you can do around power, around efficiency, around uh, density. And so where we're having great success, and actually we provide a lot of solutions to uh, not Google, but the others that you mentioned, is that we, we, we take it on as a data center problem. And th those customers are solving a much bigger problem uh, tied very much to their business model rather than to a one you server. Do they buy or do they have uh, arrangements to do one new servers? Uh, uh, from people other than Dell, yes. When you look at, uh, even in the customers you mentioned, their most highly valued and uh, things that provide you know, performance uh, per watt, per square foot, per cooling capacity to solve within a financial envelope, we are continuing to drive solutions to that set of customers and then to the next tier down because they, uh, unlike maybe the largest, the ones that you named, 
they're also looking for uh, you know, software integration solutions around Hadoop and Mac Regroups and other things to bring that cloud-like uh, uh, you know, revolutionary application model to the, to the workloads. And, and we're providing that as well for those particular customers. And that business continues to grow because we're adding more value than that uh, when you note it server. Hi, uh, Patrick, the computer world. This is a question from Michael Bell. When you made your opening remarks, you said uh, we still care about the client device, and you said it with such emphasis that I couldn't help but think of HP. Um, <laughs> whatever for. So I'd like to ask you, why do you still care about the client device, and what do you think about HP's decision to potentially spin off their division? <laughs> You know, there, there are a billion and a half PCs in the world, and that seems to me like a pretty big number. Estimates are that there'll be two billion PCs in a few years, and so it's a growth market. If, if you look at where does computing happen, yes, there are data centers, there are all sorts of things, but the client device is actually still quite important. Now, the client device is changing, right? We have smartphones, we have tablets, we see generally those new devices are augmenting the PC. And so we don't see the PC going away at all. We see our customers continuing to use PCs as part of the total solution. There are also big economic uh, reasons to be in the client business. The, the client devices drive the vast majority of the usage of the components that go inside all computing products. So if you take disk drives, for example, about 95% of all disk drives in the world go in PCs, and about 5% go in servers and storage. And the same is true in microprocessors, the same is true in memory chips. And so from a, from a, from a cost standpoint, you get enormous scale, and if you're not in that client device, you're not able to provide a complete end-to-end -end solution to the customer, and you have to charge a lot more for it. So we, we also know from our history, certainly, that there is an enormous connection from one device to another. So as we work with customers to provide client devices, and then servers, and then storage, and systems management, and networking, and security, the foundation of that business for us is the client business. Now certainly our business is much, much broader today, but to take away one part of, of the solution we don't think makes, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, thank you. I have a question for Mr. Dell. Uh, because Lenovo said in China that uh, it hopes to become the number two PC maker worldwide by the end of this year. Uh, do you think this will happen? Does Dell feel the challenge and how does Dell protect its position in the PC market? Thank you. I think if, if your measurement is the number of units sold, Lenovo could easily be the number two PC company in the world. If your measurement is revenue or profits, no. Uh, we as Dell are much more focused on the revenues and the profits as opposed to the number of units sold. Let me use an example going back to the server. There are many different kinds of servers, right? You could have a server for $500. You could also have a server for $5,000 or for $50,000. Or you could even have a server for $500,000. So what is a unit? I think if you look to the financial results of Dell, you can see a company that's very focused on delivering high value solutions to customers and certainly you see that showing up in our financial results. But Lenovo is a, a, a great competitor of ours. We have a lot of respect for them. And you know, we, we have a, maybe a different strategy in terms of providing a complete solution, certainly from the data center uh, perspective and all the solutions that we provide. If you look at the tablet market today, it's pretty much dominated by one vendor, which is Apple. You have a product in the street, but it's not really made dead in the market. So what's your plan to really go and you know, make a big success in the tablet market like you have with PCs? 
I think you're absolutely right. If you look at the tablet market today, basically you'd say it's an iPad market. And what we see as the, as the challengers to the iPad are Windows 8 and Android. You're going to hear a fair bit from Steve Ballmer about Windows 8, and certainly we are very aligned with Microsoft around Windows 8 and quite excited about that. Android is certainly another opportunity as well. Uh, you know, that part of the opportunity, at least in the market, has not developed to the expectations that, that, that many would, would have had. But we think those are the two uh, primary uh, you know, alternatives to, to, to iPad. And you'll hear, you'll hear more about Windows 8 uh, from us. And, and uh, you'll see certainly a wide range of products around Windows 8's release. Just return to the turmoil and uncertainty theme for a second. Does do the events in Europe um, and the potential for another credit market lockup like we had in 2008 concern the team in terms of you know vulnerability of corporate sales, lack of lending? Is that is that something that's on your radar? Paul, well, why don't you uh, chime in here and give your perspective? Yeah, there's no question that the economic environment in Western Europe and North America, for that matter, uh, some of the public spending uh, cuts that are happening in these markets uh, certainly affect our whole industry and uh, in our business. We continue to be focused on what is a multi-year transformation in the business and gaining more than our fair share of the opportunities in, in the customer environment, particularly now that many of them are going through a very tough time. We just finished the U.S. federal government year-end, for instance, at the end of September, and that was one of the toughest years for our federal customers in a long, long time because of the uh, budget pressure that, that they were under. And we found lots of new opportunities, different kinds of opportunities, where customers were really looking hard at how they could save 10 percent of their budget, in some cases 20 percent of their budget, and how we could bring the whole range of solutions that uh, Michael, Steve, and Brad discussed uh, earlier to bear on that. So we're still quite optimistic about our ability to gain share in the parts of that opportunity that are most important to us. But there's no question that the, the market environment uh, impacts our whole industry. Dave, why don't you, why don't you chime in here? Uh, you know, Dave Johnson is uh, right in the middle of this every day, and you know, I think Dave looks looks at it together with, with myself and the team about 250 potential acquisitions a year to maybe find uh, the eight or so that we'll actually acquire. But I'll let Dave kind of describe uh, a little bit how we think about that. Yeah, our philosophy is really about how we, you know, help solve our customers' problems and also enhance shareholder value. So it's a combination of the attributes of the acquiring company with the attributes that Bell possesses that in, in, in combination provide tremendous both velocity and value. And generally what we find of that is that a mid-sized company really can benefit the most by our ability from a brand perspective as well as our capability, you know, from a sales and distribution perspective to really dramatically grow that and enhance both the value for the customer and the shareholder. The other thing, as Michael articulated, we're really seeking out opportunities that have a tremendous value proposition for our customers. And there's many of those today because of the rate of pace of change, both from a technical perspective as well as from a business model perspective. But the reality is most of those companies, by definition, are sort of new because these are evolving trends. So there aren't huge blockbuster companies, by definition, that are in the new model of these disruptive trends. So if we want to ride a disruptive trend for it, provide tremendous value to our customer and, and yield great shareholder value, it argues that you should find those types of companies that generally are more mid-sized. And that's been really our path. With these battle lines being drawn by Oracle and Salesforce and you know everybody else, um, how do you manage those relationships so that you know these kinds of religious wars don't get in the way of serving the customer? I think it, it might be useful just to step back and think about our industry a little bit. You know, we, the total industry is about $3 trillion. And there are, in the United States, about 
10 companies that have more than 1% of that $3 trillion. There's no company that has more than 10% of the $3 trillion. And so you actually have an enormous industry that is highly dispersed and it has an ecosystem effect to it that is quite significant. So here at Dell World, for example, we're gonna have many of our partners. We'll have Microsoft, Intel, VMware, Citrix, and many, many others. We continue to believe that the industry will work in this ecosystem fashion and you don't have any company that's really anywhere near having a double digit percentage of that three trillion dollars. And so, uh, you know, we, we happen to be one of those companies that has, you know, that, that, that is one of the 10 that, that has more than, than 1% of, of, the, of the three trillion. But there are only, you know, as I said, uh, 10. So are you finding any resistance from your potential customers because they're afraid of going to you for everything? And if so, how are you assuaging those concerns for them? Steve, why don't you, why don't you address this? Sure. Um, first of all, um, Brad did a fantastic job of talking about his overall architected approach, which enables heterogeneity for the exact reason that you have for your question. We do believe customers value their past and the investments that they've made as well as the things they want to do in the future, and they do not want to be locked into no choice. Our whole design principle is around open systems that allow for choice at every layer, capability that is competitive if not leading at every one of those layers, and affordability, which says we will manage to both your capex and your OPEX needs, not just your OPEX needs. So we think that's a pretty good strategy. We're applying that strategy across every element of our solutions. In the services space, we also enable heterogeneity. We have the ability and willingness and uh, desire to support our customers' choices. Now, we will work hard to make sure that the technology that works best for the customers is Dell technology but we will not take that choice out of their hands in any way, shape, or form. And so we have dozens and dozens and dozens of examples of this. But one of the most acute ones that really brings it home is the work that Brad's team has done around uh, the scale acquisition. With that acquisition, we are bringing systems management software that allows for heterogeneity at every level of the stack in the data center and allows for heterogeneity at the hypervisor level. And we bear the cost of making sure all of that works to our customer's choice. And from a hardware vendor standpoint, we're the only ones who have, who have taken that as a fundamental design point to make sure that the sole, the, the sole purpose of your question is honored. And we, we also serve 10 million small, medium-sized businesses and I think have a unique perspective on your question from that vantage point. So Steve, Felice, could you kind of address it from the standpoint of, of what you hear from our growing uh, SMB business? Because I think that's an exciting, exciting part of the economy. Well, I, I think the, the difference when you start talking about SMBs is they typically don't have a, an IT expert that's uh, guiding the IT strategy. Uh, some companies do as they get to be larger in size, but most of these companies have generalists and they seek a trusted advisor and they value that tremendously. And a lot of the research we've done uh, proves that out. Uh, we started research several years ago that guided our strategy in the SMB market based on feedback from customers that said, you know, when we asked them, who would you trust the most for secure solutions? And Dell came out number one. Or who would you want to buy applications from? And Dell came out number one. Uh, and so we started to learn that this direct relationship that we have with them and the fact that they are generalists guides us to want to be a full service provider. But the, the, the other big difference is that the solutions we provide have to be uh, simple to use. And that's what we've stressed in, in the acquisitions that we've done. Case is a terrific example of when a company gets to be 50 or more employees 
and they need to start tracking their assets and the software that's on and the changes that are needed. Uh, in the past, they'd have to hire a fairly expensive talent to do that, uh, and it would be a pretty manual process. And with Case, this is a product that's very cost effective, but most important, it provisions in about two hours, and it doesn't require an IT expert to maintain it. And those are the kinds of solutions that we're driving to the small and medium business. So they are seeking um, a one-stop shop, but they want simplicity, they want reliability, and they want to be able to trust the provider. I come from Mexico. Uh, you... What is this? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> do you think uh, Latin America is a good market for them? We do. Uh, Paul, why don't, you, why don't you address that? You, you, you've uh, got, got a fair bit of experience in that market? Yeah, it's a fantastic market for Dell, and while there are many countries that we look after in the region, clearly Mexico and Brazil between them are the overwhelming large economies, overwhelming large IT markets. We have been investing there for quite a long time. Uh, we have a uh, center that supports uh, Spanish-speaking Latin America out of Panama. We have a large presence in Mexico. We actually have manufacturing down in Brazil for the southern part of the hemisphere. So there's a lot of fundamental capability there, thousands of people who are, are supporting our customers there. And the fundamental strategy is the same. So everything you've heard us talk about so far are really understanding that customer in the, or the Mexican market, really getting to this fundamental transformation that customers are trying to do and make it real and make it implementable right there in the, in the local market. And if you have a minute on the way out, I see Peter began at the back here, you want to raise your hand? There, Peter is our general manager for Latin America, also based in Mexico, so he could tell you lots more about it. Hi, uh, question to the executive team. This is Ray Wong from Constellation Research. Uh, you guys traditionally have spent a lot of time focusing on industries like healthcare, industries like public sector, and an OEM business. Uh, I was kind of curious as to what are the new industries that you're excited about, that you're willing to place a bet on and say, here's our software, here's our systems, here's our overall kind of solutions approach. Steve, you want to you want to give a perspective on that? Sure, and, I, and Paul's been doing a lot of work around this as well. Uh, I, you know, I think between Paul and I, we're very focused on the kinds of solutions that solve specific pain points in banking and fi you know, financial services. We've done some work around the manufacturing space, and we've really based our core center of competence for the manufacturing base out of China, as an example, given the center of gravity that has shifted so much in that, in that direction and looking for solutions that really serve that market well. Um, you know, we are uh, doing some pretty innovative things, frankly, in the whole retail space. Um, so, you know, today our uh, strategy has a fair amount of specific hardware solutions and some specific IP and software and application solutions in it. And that stack on an end-to-end -end basis is complete in the healthcare space, relatively mature in the education space, and I would say emerging in the other spaces. But I think they will grow rather rapidly as we, as, as you look into next year. Yeah, the only thing I'd add is uh, while you're all here at Dell World, definitely spend some time on the expo floor because we've laid out a number of these vertical market solutions. Some are expressly by healthcare or banking and finance. Others are in a whole section around the solution centers that were described earlier, where you can see the, the types of solutions that are actually being uh, developed there, how we customize those for, the, uh, uh, for each one of these sectors. One example, for instance, is a software package called uh, Proof, which is basically business intelligence for the manufacturing sector that's Dell IP. So you'll, be, you'll see a team there and uh, uh, by, by all means kind of pick their brains on the, the current state of these solutions. Hi, Aaron Mercadell with Bloomberg News. Michael, can you talk a little bit more about the tablet computer market and in some of your comments earlier, you were saying that the Android-based tablets hadn't quite moved up to expectations. What more are you guys looking for in terms of features or in terms of management of the ecosystem there? You know, I'm not really sure I have anything to add to my comments. You're gonna hear us talk more about Windows 8 tomorrow, and you'll hear Steve Ballmer talk about Windows 8. Uh, certainly, if you followed the Microsoft Build Conference recently, you got a real flavor for that. 
I think Android's done really well on a smartphone and not so much on, on the tablet. Ulrike Ostler, I'm from TikTok, Germany. I have three different questions. The first one is about the data center of the future. How will it look like? Uh, for example, regarding um, energy efficiency, will it be all uh, pre-configured containers? Or, um, let's say, exadata-like um, machines? That's the first Brad. question. Yeah, so the data center of the future, there's a lot of data centers of the future because our customers have a lot of plans. Uh, we today already ship containerized data centers. We have a number of very large customers, actually uh, some of them not so large, where they have requirements that have want them to have rapid computing capabilities almost instantaneously. And so you've seen these containers, literally they're like shipping containers where we can stand up 2,500 servers fully configured, networking, power, infrastructure. They can actually be cooled by ambient air, so there's no, no elaborate uh, you know, cooling technology necessary, and provide that capability. Uh, and we've done that quite recently, where it's from kind of order to data center deployment in a matter of a few weeks, which is just pretty revolutionary. What is really exciting about that, and we just stood up one in, uh, in Vegas, on a roof, now, in Vegas, in the summertime, it's a little bit warm. And so this is on a rough ambient temperature. And so there's, no, again, no elaborate cooling. And, and, and it works quite well in that environment. So you can imagine if you put it in Vegas, we have a, we still have another one in Colorado. Well, it kind of rains a little bit there. I mean, and so this is a pretty fascinating thing. The other thing is we have, and it was, goes back almost to this, uh, you know, uh, data center question. Uh, we have a system that, uh, in these containerized, where the P P U E, which is power efficiency index, meaning a watt comes in and how much of that watt gets translated into real workload capabilities versus being kind of wasted in infrastructure, a P U E of 1.05. That means almost every watt in drives to constructive work, and so that's the kind of value that we're driving, and and and, and the containerized clouds help customers respond to their business opportunities uh, so much quicker. Also, a lot of businesses still have their doubts about how secure and secure the cloud is. How do you address that? I, I, my question is about cloud, cloud security, and cloud adoption. Right. Yeah. What kind of clients come to you for cloud? Sure. Um, basically, what we're seeing in terms of the requirements from clients today is a tremendous amount of interest in the cloud overall as a topic and implementations that are private. We certainly have instances where customers want to use the public cloud for really low security need, you know, it could be a dev test or that kind of environment, but for production workload for our commercial customers, the request is very much around private clouds. Now, it's a little bit of a unique animal in that a private cloud implemented for one customer they still would like to have the flexibility to be able to take advantage of capacity, but not pay for that capacity when they're not using it. So that cuts, cuts a little bit against the grain of private clouds. The way we're approaching that with our customers is, and we've got education customers who have huge spikes during registration periods. We have customers that are in the cloud that have huge spikes during tax season, and a variety of other different offsets. So by selling to those customers a standardized configuration and a standardized approach to the cloud, where the processes and the tools and the technologies are interchangeable from one private cloud to the next, we can bring a fair amount of flexibility so that your volumes can, can go low and spike high, and we can bring some of the, the variable um, uh, pricing methodologies to bear in these private if you will, multi-tenant kind of cloud environments. And it's working quite well. We've got a number of good customers who have engaged and are quite not only excited, but we've, we've successfully sold and have successfully implemented the solutions. And over the past few years, Dell has embraced the channel more and more. We'd like to understand what the vision is of the future and the go-forward strategy in working with the channel. Thank you. We have made a lot of progress there and really pleased with the growth of the channel program. You know, we'll have by the end of this month 
100,000 channel partners, and that is a big change from three or four years ago. Uh, Steve, you, you spend a fair amount of time in the field with these channel partners, as, as do I. Why don't you give your perspective on what we're learning and, and uh, go ahead. Well, I think the big change we made over the years was to move this from a volume focus to a value focus with, with the partners, and they really appreciate that. So we've shifted this strategy to one that emphasizes certification and training uh, on all the solutions we have. So everything that we offer to customers, we try to make available to the channel. And we just, what we seek are relationships where value is truly being added to the customer and the customer sees that value in the partner. And in that case, we've um, established a great um, methodology of saying, if the customer has a solution need and you have, and you have the answer, feel free to take, that, to take that business. And we embrace that that partner, and that's why I think um, you know over the years there was a lot of doubt from Dell moving from a direct business to direct and channel, and now in the last few years we've been winning awards all around the world as as one of the top channel uh, partners. Um, so I think we're way past you know the question of are we committed to the channel, uh, and now the fact that we derive a substantial amount of revenue from it, but but the uh, the most important thing is the quality of the revenue. This is. This revenue stream comes with a lot of servers and storage and pro support services. It's no longer just how do we sell more desktops and notebooks. I think the big change for us has been to really uh, alter our focus from a product or box focus to what is the real problem the customer's trying to solve. And that's taken us to solutions and services and it's changed the nature of the conversation with customers. That is allowing us to create a lot more value for customers. The relationships have more longevity, they have more meaning, they have more depth. We're not dealing with sort of the component parts or tools that a customer uses, but rather we're helping them solve the bigger problem that they have. Given the breadth of, of customer relationships that we have and the strength of our brand, the access to customers, the ability to acquire unique assets that we've been able to leverage and drive that solutions focus faster, the addition of all the solution resources and capabilities, I think that's what's driving the strong growth in earnings and cash flow that we're seeing. And certainly, if you look at our gross margins, they're up very substantially because we're doing different things than we were doing before. Mind if I add on to that just one thing? You know, something Michael and the team talked about from the beginning is, is you know, we've never been distracted. We are an x86 company. We've always been standards based. And as a result, what's happened is, is we have the ability to innovate off of a much more simplified base at a time where the industry is also embracing those standards as the only true environment that they are innovating against going forward. So Dell, our heritage and our past is per, a perfect fit to this evolution that's occurring in the industry. Some of the competitors that you mentioned don't have such a clean slate relative to an open, standardized footprint and therefore are compromised more by the future as opposed to actually uh, able to embrace it. We're also right at the sort of uh, you know, eve of a really big change in terms of the amount of computing power that is going to be available on these x86 platforms. I'm going to talk a lot about this tomorrow, but there's never been an easier time to migrate these workloads off of the older platforms. And the new cloud environments, the enormous performance gains that we're able to have because of all the improvements in processor technology, networking technology. We bought this incredible company called Force 10, which is a leader in 10 gig and 40 gig technology. Well, this is absolutely critical as you attach large numbers of servers together and you know the, 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 uh, the whole network is becoming part of the server and storage complex with virtualization, because you're having 50, 100 virtual machines in these really, really large servers that are connected with 
very, uh, you know, very thick uh, flat tree pipes. About Dell's strategy for taking advantage of the mobile market um, and not just talking about how important it is. Thank you. You know, the first thing I'd point out is that within the three trillion dollar industry that we're in, the part that you're talking about is is an important part, but it's within it, you know it's sort of within the consumer business, which is about a two hundred and fifty billion dollar part of the three trillion dollars. And Dell is really much more focused on providing a complete set of solutions to customers that yes, include the device, but we're not really super focused on the device. We're focused on the solution and the ability to apply a complete solution uh, that, that, that perhaps includes the device, perhaps it doesn't. We're helping customers today manage a wide variety of their installed base, which sometimes includes our products, sometimes includes a variety of competitor products. I see a number of you have competitor products here, here in the room. That's the environment that we are helping our customers manage. What, what is your perspective on how the CIO role has to change and what they need to do differently now that they, they no longer can say no and stop people from using uh, technology? You know, we actually started our day in, in Round Rock and we had three CIOs with us that were sharing their perspective on those very challenges. And we are right in the middle of helping our customers address this. Steve Schuckerbrock here runs our services business, but a long, long time ago, he actually used to be a CIO. So he, he understands a bit about the challenges uh, in, in, in managing So I'm gonna let Steve uh, kind of close for us. Okay, um, great question. I, I think it, the net answer is innovate or die. I mean, you cannot run an IT organization today that does not take the core asset of the company, which is the information, and ex make that information accessible and usable by all factions of the company for business benefit. And, you know, frankly, you have to embrace the notions of consumerization, which I won't limit that word to a device. I think it's a mindset. You know, when my kids sit around the table, they don't feel encumbered by anything. They can get any information they want, any time of day, anywhere they happen to be in the world, and anything less is unacceptable to them. And so that mindset is the reality for a CIO, and so you can either try to fend it off and say, no, 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 or you can embrace it and figure out a way to make your systems behave accordingly. And that is gonna drive you to new technology, standardized infrastructure, standardized data architectures, big BI kinds of capabilities in a company, and through this, uh, and to technologies like the cloud that can help and speed the access to business value. And so we think all of those things are great for Dell. We think they're great for customers, but I think you're gonna separate the CIOs who lean into it from those that lean away from it pretty quickly as, as the next few years unfold.